So yeah, this is a um, uh, talk about proof theory. I will give some introductory material so we don't jump into too much technicality. I will I'll actually not say a lot about technicalities because it could be uh, kind of long-haired, but I hope to give enough to whet your appetites and you can look up things for yourself. And, and then I'll parse a lot of results um, that others have made, mention a few of my own observations, but that's sort of the, the idea. And at the end, I'll say a little bit about the conclusions of this kind of work and what may relevance it has for the foundational issues that we're discussing at this meeting. Okay, so let's uh, jump into the introduction. So I want to start with um, this question that uh, Saul was very fond of, uh, what rests on what? Uh, there's a paper from 93 discussing various uh, aspects of this question. But you can think of it as going back to uh, Hilbert's program. Of course, Hilbert's program in its naive form, trying to prove consistency of uh, advanced abstract uh, formal systems using finitistic methods, uh, was shadowed by Gödel's incompleteness results. But we can have a kind of relativized Hilbert's program where we prove in a weak meta theory that what we can prove in some theory T1 that rests on one foundational paradigm could instead have been proved in another theory T2, maybe that rests on a weaker or different foundational program. So the kind of foundational reductions we could hope to achieve is we could reduce an infinitary theory to a finitary theory, or perhaps an uncountably infinitary theory to a countably finitary theory, or we could do a reduction of an, an on the face of it impredicative theory to a predicative theory. And on the following slides, I will say a bit more about predicativity, also because several people have asked me during the meeting. And of course, the last one is also something that people are very interested in, reduce non-constructive theories and methods to constructive theories and methods, and thereby you can hope to extract some constructive content from non-constructive proofs. Um, Another aspect of this that I'm not going to talk about but was mentioned is the reverse mathematics program, which is similar in spirit. You try to see um, what exactly do you need to prove a given mathematical theorem. So you try to do mathematics in reverse. Instead of proving theorems from axioms, you pr try to recover some axioms from the theorems. Of course, uh, not using that axiom in your meta theory, you use some very weak base theory to do this kind of thing. Uh, so let's uh, talk a bit about predicativity and the background of that. So um, kind of arose in a response to the uh, paradoxes, for instance, Russell's paradox. And uh, so Poincaré and Russell both formulated different variations of this vicious circle principle. I'll give a quote on the next slide. But the idea is that uh, it's sort of a constructivist mind mindset. You think of what we're doing in mathematics as we're bringing in objects into existence by defining them. And so we need some principles that tells us when are we allowed to do this? When are we allowed to create ex nihilo some mathematical objects just by, by some definition saying this is what it is? And the idea is that we're not supposed to define something in terms of, you know, indirectly in terms of itself because that might lead to this vicious circle. It's kind of what we're doing when we define the Russell set of all the sets don't contain themselves. Right? It contains a vicious circle because we're defining something a set in terms of the collection of all sets. You have a similar worry if you're defining a new proposition by quantifying over all existing propositions. Okay, so Samelo and many and most mathematicians have this kind of idea that, well, we don't really think it's something illogical. We do it all the time. What's the problem? Um, so that's, uh, that's basically been the mainstream view. But uh, you know, a small subset of mathematicians have had this worry, and uh, it turns out it has something to do with maybe logical strength. Um, it also has something to do with, you know, can we explicitly solve the problem? Michael Rachin mentioned uh, similar I issues yesterday. Uh, maybe with an impredicative principle, we can we get a big hammer and we can solve more problems, but we really have no idea what kind of solution we're getting from that, whereas if we work a bit harder, we can get a more explicit solution to our problem. Okay, and then I want to mention this very influential book by Hermann Weil, uh, Das Continuum. Uh, so, so Melo said, well, we, we would be totally hampered in doing real analysis if we were to follow the vicious circle principle of not allowing the least upper bound principle for, um, for the real numbers. Uh, but Weil sort of noticed that, well, most of the time we don't really need the least upper bound for any bounded subset. We just need it for some explicitly defined sequence, and that's perfectly uh, predicatively acceptable. 
Okay, so here is a quote from Whitehead and Russell. Uh, the principle which enables us to avoid illegitimate totalities may be stated as follows. Whatever involves all of a collection must not be one of the collection. We shall call this the vicious circle principle because it enables us to avoid the vicious circles involved in the assumption of illegitimate totalities. Okay. So that's the idea. Um, another thing you might think of that is uh, of relevance here, well, what about the natural numbers? Aren't you in trouble already there? You are saying that the natural numbers are the things you get by starting with zero and iterating the successor function some finite number of times. What does finite mean? Well, it's given by a natural number. Oh, well. Okay, so what people usually mean is we take um, predicativity given the natural numbers. We say, okay, this is a definite totality. That's okay. We can quantify over the natural numbers, and we're not doing something, you know, we're not defining. Uh, the, new, the natural numbers uh, by the definition theory to take them as a granted totality. And then we say, okay, well, what, do, what if we do that? And then we say, but the sets and subsets of natural numbers, those we bring into existence by our writing down an explicit definition for them. And then we iterate this, this construction, and people, of course, wondered, how far can you go? And one way to analyze this is to look at these systems of ramified analysis, where you say, um, okay, we build up the definable subsets of the natural numbers, the first order definable subsets. That's now a collection. Let's gather that up into a set. Let's build definable subsets of those, uh, and so on. And we iterate up through the ordinals, and you can go up to an ordinal level alpha if you have previously secured alpha somehow. But where previously secured means you've proved that alpha is, a, is an ordinal, an actual ordinal. Okay, so this leads to the pfefferman schutte analysis of predicativity, giving this ordinal gamma naught that already Michael mentioned yesterday. Okay. Now, there has been some quibbles with this analysis, um, basically having to do with constructivity and generalized predicativity. Um, the idea is, well, what about functions? Already in Gödel's T, you're doing something impredicative if you're doing uh, primitive, recursion, primitive recursion at a goal type, which is not a, a simple type, but a higher type. Uh, well, not a first, not a first order type, just some uh, function from n to the k to n, but some functional, some higher order functional. You're doing something impredicative, but it seems to be okay because we, maybe we can take the, the function concept as granted. It's also something that Michael mentioned. We can start with some notion of computation and then build on top of that, and that allows us to go a bit beyond this and. Um, Actually, type theories have been very uh, useful in trying to, to establish what, what could this kind of generalized predicativity mean, something that goes beyond just gamma naught, uh, but it's not full on in predicative where you quantify over all propositions all the time. Okay. So what is an ordinal analysis? That's a, just going to be a very brief one-slide introduction to a part of proof theory, in case uh, some of you have not seen it before. So what we do in, in proof theory sometimes is we measure the strength of a, of a theory in terms of what are its provable uh, primitive recursive well orders. So and we could define the proof theoretic ordinal of a theory T as follows. Take the ordinal of T to be the, the least ordinal that is above the order types of the primitive recursive well-founded uh, ordinals that are provable in the theory T. So, uh, as defined here, as, to, as I say, it's defined as a rather blunt invariant because it turns out that you can, for instance, take a theory, calculate its ordinal this way, add any true arithmetic statement that you like, and you don't change this thing because this uh, statement here is a pi one, one statement, uh, so it's above arithmetic strength. Okay, but in fact, when you look at the calculations, they do in fact give much more precise information and give some so-called more refined pi zero two ordinal analysis, where we get, you don't have to know exactly what that level of the arithmetic hierarchy is, just know that it corresponds to knowing what are the provably total uh, computable functions that you can access with the theory. Okay, so this is too complicated to go into here, but uh, at least now you know that these things uh, are something that we do. Okay. So let me now do a bit of 
prehistory, uh, before homotopy type theory, what we know about type theory and uh, proof theory and relations between various theories. So here's a brief history of type theory and proof theory, so to speak. Okay, so I um, don't know if this was mentioned, but the first type theory proposed by Martin Löw had this um, uh, very impredicative nature that you had a type of all types, and type was a type, and there was no uh, stratification among the, the type levels. It was just one universe, and it was a member of itself. And of course, sort of, you, maybe you can expect now, but maybe it wasn't obvious at the time, this is inconsistent, and Shirar um, derived an actual inconsistency. Okay, so Pierre said, well, probably there's something to this predicativity thing, so he introduced this predicative version of the type theory that has uh, infinitely many universes, each contained um, in the following one, but in a stratified level, a stratified manner. There's still no identity types, as far as I know. Uh, but we can you know, think of these as math mathematical systems, and we can try to calculate how much of um, uh, basic arithmetic truth do we get from these. And so 77, I put in Axel, um, proved that the first level, so if you have a universe and you do uh, reasoning with that, you get a bit beyond piano arithmetic. Of course, epsilon zero is this famous ordinal uh, from Gensen uh, that measures the strength of piano arithmetic. Okay. Then in 73, uh, 79, we get this period uh, in Peirce's work on type theory where we have extensional type theory. And uh, so this uh, is something they took and, run with, uh, and with in, ran with in Cornell, and this is the basis of the new Perl uh, system. And I'll mention that again at the very end. Uh, meanwhile, more proof theoretic work was done, as um, Michael also mentioned yesterday. Uh, Yerville proved some lower bounds, and Pfefferman proved upper bounds that together established that uh, Martin of type theory without inductive types, but this predicative hierarchy of universes is a predicatively reducible system. It has this proof theoretic ordinal uh, gamma naught. Okay? And there was also work, if you just want this final result and not the, the fine structure of each level, uh, there was also work by Axel and Beeson. Okay. Then in 84, a pair introduces uh, the identity types and we get the intentional uh, with, with the you know, intentional elimination rule, so this is the basis of what they later become, became hot. Uh, but now let's continue with the story of what was done uh, on the proof theory. So Eric Palmgrain sort of broke a lot of ground by interpreting what are called the ID systems, systems of generalized inductive definitions, into type theory. And then Mark, uh, Anton Setzer at Munich in his PhD thesis um, gave this, this bound and you don't really have to know what these functions are, you just have to see that it looks very impredicative because we're referring to, say, uh, an inaccessible ordinal. I'm going to explain what those are in just a little bit. And then we have this collapsing function, so it's something like we're defining a small ordinal by reference to some very large ordinals. Uh, so this is Martin Löw type theory with one universe and the W type. So the W type really buys you a lot of strength. But I should also mention that uh, we had this picture that uh, Michael Rachin drew, drew uh, that that Pierre all had, uh, proved, had uh, drawn in the conference in 98, where you had all the type theories, even with, with W types, and they're way below this level, uh, pi 1, 2 comprehension in uh, subsets of second order uh, arithmetic, which uh, Pierre had called this the hell, right? So they're much weaker than that, and then, of course they're much weaker than Semelo or even Semelo Frankel set theory. Okay, so then we had some more work. Um, if you have just one inductive, a special inductive type, you, in fact, get one inductive definition. Uh, and there was more words. Then people started to get a little crazy on what kind of induction principles you can do. You had this Marlowe universes and induction recursion, and there's still something to be said about that. Um, maybe of interest is the very last slide, a very last line on this slide. Um, instead of having this externally indexed hierarchy of universes, so you have universe number one, universe number two, but the theory can't name these universes uh, by the numbers. Uh, you can do a slight variation where you just have um, a universe operator that says, okay, given any type, you tell the theory, give me a universe that contains this type. So it has a next universe operator. Uh, but that doesn't change this, the strength. Um, Eric Palmgren had introduced something called a super universe. And so this is kind of like a, a large cardinal assumption in type theory, but if you don't have uh, W types, you don't have in generalized inductive types, it stays at some intermediate level. So this is stronger than 
uh, ordinary predicative, uh, an ordinary predicative theory, but it's far below these things that really refer to um, to large large ordinals in order to name small ordinals. Okay, so. A very useful tool to analyze these. I want to mention this because uh, we're talking a bit about set theory as well. So a very basic tool to do proof theory at this level is the, this theory, kripke uh that has these axioms, extensionality, the pair, union, and foundation, pretty much as usual. And then, as Michael also mentioned, we have bounded separation, which is a predicative version of separation. Right? In separation, you say, given a set, you can cut out any subset defined by a first-order formula that can quantify over the entire universe of sets. So you're defining a new set by reference to the totality of all sets is clearly against the vicious circle principle, whereas the bounded separation principle is not because we, we get rid of all the unbounded quantifier and so all quantifiers are bounded in this, in this way we have here. So this is a bounded quantifier, or this is a bounded quantifier. So every quantifier has a bound. Then it's not, no longer um, objectionable. Okay. Uh, also, we need this, uh, this axiom, uh, delta zero collection. Uh, so it says for any bounded formula, if, um, so we have parameters v, and so for any u, uh, and if for all x and u there's some y such that f of x, y, v, then you can collect to get a z, so that for all x and u there's a y in z, so it collects all the, these uh, values uh, y. Okay. So it turns out on basis of this you can actually do a lot of set theory. You can define many concepts and uh, you can sort of hit the ground running and it's a quite weak theory. Okay, so uh, to explain uh, the proof theoretic terminology a bit more, let me just introduce what it means to be admissible and an admissible ordinal. So a transitive set is called admissible if it's a model of kripke platek um, And so, uh, for instance, the hereditarily finite sets uh, is a model, but if you include the axiom of infinity, you get a, uh, sort of uh, larger admissible uh, sets. So an ordinal is then called admissible if uh, the level L alpha of Gödel's constructible hierarchy uh, is an admissible set, and we also saw this in Mirna's talk yesterday. Uh, so you, you get the constructible hierarchy by starting with the empty set and iterating the first order definable uh, subsets. Okay. Um, now an ordinal is called recursively inaccessible if it's admissible and, ad and a limit of admissibles. Okay, so now you've learned something. Uh, so here's a little table of a lot of work in uh, proof theoretic ordinal analysis. So what we have is a, a list of systems of increasing strength. And uh, so the ordinals are here. And then there's kind of a first, some first order uh, systems that are kind of reference systems that tell you how many times you iterate an inductive definition or maybe an, an iterated fixed point. You don't have the induction principle, but you just say that there exists some fixed point. Then we have some set theories. They're all variations of um, kripke platek and we, here we could also put uh, some variations of constructive set theory. Uh, and then on the right column, uh, we have type theories. So the first one is a phenotistically acceptable uh, type theory uh, proposed by Ludovic Pate and Hugo Abelin called the calculus of primitive recursive constructions. And you can, in fact, give some uh, improvements to this, which are uh, uh, homotopy type theories. Okay. And then the next level, we have our, one of our favorite first-order systems of arithmetic, piano arithmetic, the, the famous ordinal epsilon zero. And at, at the set theoretic level, you take uh, kripke platek plus infinity, but you remove foundation and replace it with just induction on the numbers. Then it's a very close analogy just to, uh, to PA, just in terms of sets. And as a type theory, you could take a, a very basic formulation of modern type theory without universes, but just some way of introducing um, atomic formulas. OK, uh, now we have the level of the, the limit of predicativity given the natural numbers, but not in the sense of generalized predicativity. And this corresponds to iterating fixed points finitely many times, or it corresponds in kripke platek to having the universe be a limit of admissibles, but not necessarily admissible itself, but again without, um, without foundation, but with induction on the numbers. Or it corresponds to this theory of type theory where you don't use generalized inductive types, but you have this hierarchy of universes. 
Then we have sort of this uh, intermediate step before we go into the generalized predicative level. We have some something uh, that proof theory is called meta-predicative levels, and I mentioned this system before, modern of type theory with a super universe. Um, okay. Then we start getting into some uh, generalized inductive definition. So we have generalized predicativity. Here is one generalized inductive definition with one universe. Uh, that corresponds to the famous system ID1 or Kripke Platic plus infinity. So now we have foundation that gives us this inductive strength. Okay. Then we can go on a little, str a, little, a little more. So Michael mentioned this one yesterday, and it's also this level here. So uh, this level is uh, maybe what you know from, uh, from the lean proof assistant, something like that. So you have ordinary inductive types, and you have finitely many universes, but you don't have prop. Uh, so cock would be much, much stronger than this, because you have the, the universe of prop. And on the level of set theory, it's like uh, assuming that uh, the universe is um, uh, is uh, a limit of inaccessibles. Okay. Um, so uh, if you want to have constructive set theories, let me just mention this as well. On this level, for the predicative level, those are the two most important ones for us today. So on the level of the third row here, if you want something that is just at the limit of predicativity, you could take um, Axel C set F, but you, um, you remove epsilon induction uh, and replace it by induction in the natural numbers, and then you have um, uh, an axiom stated that every set is contained in an inaccessible set, where in an inaccessible set is kind of a constructive formulation of an inaccessible uh, universe. Okay, and, and down here it also corresponds to a very nice system of constructive set theory, C set F plus this... Uh, um, uh, this axiom that everything is contained in an inaccessible. So you see, if you have foundation, you get a lot of mileage out of having these uh, universes. But if you don't have foundation or inductive types, then it sort of stays at a manageable level. There's a question. Yeah. When you say ML, is this there's no universe? Are there natural numbers or there are natural numbers? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there are natural numbers. There's so you have what? I wanted to ask a clarification question. So when you say, uh, so you have the proof theoretic strength yeah. represented by the ordinal number, and then you have these different systems. Yeah. Are you suggesting that if we allow some sort of translation between these things, then we can have, um, they are <laughs> equally strong? Uh, so at the very basic level, I'm just saying that they have uh, the same uh, proof theoretic strength. But in fact, there are interpretations between them that have, uh, that are, that give conservativity interpreting for some subclass of formulas. So between two of the constructive systems, you can certainly translate Heiting arithmetic uh, from one to the other. And in classical ones, you can certainly in, in, uh, interpret piano arithmetic, the, the basic language of arithmetic, and get conservativity for those. But that's, a little, that, that's something you get after the fact. When you look at the analysis, or maybe you then you think of a translation, uh, like the, the uh, translations Mike mentioned, um, of having sets as trees in type theory or having uh, types as sets, but then you get. Just to, to clarify, I mean, so you, you could, two logical systems could have the same proof theoretic ordinal without there being translation. That's right. You can have basically yeah. only the only formula that you can uh, translate a proof for is uh, bottom or something like that. And that, that implies that the consistency strengths match up, but uh, not much more. Okay. Sorry, so they don't have to be bi-interpretable at No, they all. don't have to be bi-interpretable. And you can, you can cook up examples where it's, that it's not possible to give by interpretations. But most natural systems will have some class of, and maybe not all formulas, but some subclass of formulas that you can interpret proofs from one to the other. KPH is uh, the universe is a limit of recursive inaccessibles, yes. is also admissibility? It's an admissible limit of recursive inaccessibles? Um, <laughs> no, I don't think you should add that. Uh, that gives you some extra boost. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the kind of homotopy type theory. So not, now we, we've talked about the history of relating um, type theories to set theories and calculating their proof theoretic strength. So now let's try to add some homotopy type theory on top of that. And I'm going to do this in a very simple-minded way. I'm just going to say, add the univalence axiom for the universes. 
um, and add maybe just one higher inductive type. And I'm going to explain why, for most purposes of what, what we're doing with home entropy type theory right now, uh, that seems to be a good approach, even though we would like to understand much more complicated higher inductive types as well. Okay, so of course some of you went to my workshop, but maybe some of you didn't. Uh, so higher inductive types are often just called hits. And a simple example is we would like to introduce some, uh, some topological structure into our type theory. So we could introduce a circle as the free infinity groupoid generated by a point and a loop at that point. Okay. So what we're doing is it's like doing free, freely generated sets. We're just freely generating an infinity groupoid instead by adding uh, some points, some arrows or paths, and some higher arrows and some higher paths. Okay. So for the kind of thing we're doing at the moment, but obviously it may not be enough for everything one wants to do, it's, uh, we actually only use uh, you know, some very finitary high, uh, high inductive types, and they are actually seem to be all reducible just to homotopy pushouts. The homotopy pushout is the inductive type or high inductive type defined by two functions with the same domain, and then you generate a new type D that has uh, a left inclusion, a right inclusion, and this glue path constructor, so that's a defining feature. Again, you saw it also in this loop case. You can uh, add, a, uh, add a constructor at a morphism level or higher morphism level. So this says that uh, basically if you draw the square, the square commutes. Okay. Uh, so in the lean uh, hot library and also in, with work of other people, we know that um, you can uh, define many, many hits you need to do synthetic homotopy theory just in terms of these pushouts. Of course, you get homotopy co-equalizers, suspensions, joins, sequential co-limits. And you also get uh, these classifying types of discrete groups. Let me just say one word about what this means. So in, in homotopy type theory, we interpret the types as infinity groupoids. So uh, infinity group would then be a pointed connected type. And uh, a group would then be a pointed connected one truncated type. But of course, we have another definition of group, namely in terms of a set with an operation satisfying the, the group laws. Uh, so we would like to go back and forth between the, those. And one of the directions, if you give me a discrete group, I can give you its classifying type, the type with one point and the paths being the group elements uh, as a higher inductive type. And also there's something called the rest completion that gives you, a, given a set presentation of a category, uh, gives you a, its univalent version. Okay, but you can also do these truncations, which are very important in work in homotopy type theory. The, the propositional truncation uh, in Lean, it was done by Van Dorn. There also worked by Nikolai Krauss. Um, and then the end truncation was recently shown to be constructible just using pushouts and other inductive types, and ordinary inductive types by Egbert Reike. Okay. So actually for the proof theoretic, things I'm going to mention in this talk, we're just going to talk about the homotopy push-out. Of course, later on, we would like to uh, say something proof theoretically about more complicated hits, such as the, the Cauchy reals. Here we have a, uh, a definition that doesn't require countable choice uh, of a Cauchy complete set. Uh, and here we, and so this is the way it's done in the hot book. We take a Cauchy sequence to be indexed by the positive rational, so it gives you a real that is within uh, epsilon of the limit, uh, given a positive uh, rational epsilon. Okay, and then, so you basically say, given any such sequence, if it's a Cauchy sequence, then it defines a point in R, and if two sequences uh, are within epsilon of each other for all epsilon, then there's actually a path between them in the type of reals. And then simultaneously, you have to define uh, this relation of being less than epsilon close for two reals. And then you have to add a constructor for, oh, that should be set truncation. Sorry about that. OK, you can also do a version of the cumulative hierarchy uh, using a sort of a complicated higher inductive type. I mainly just mention those to advertise them and not because I'm going to study them in this talk. OK. Um, also, I don't think we have discussed yet what are the open problems in homotopy type theory, so I wanted to put in a slide of that. Uh, the main thing we would like to know, uh, basically the first thing that Bobotsky asked, was this homotopy canonicity property. So adding uh, some of these uh, high inductive types and adding univalence breaks the usual computational properties of type theory. Uh, one of them being canonicity, if you have a closed term whose type is the natural numbers, you can compute it and you get a numeral. 
and it's the definitionally equal to a numeral. But if you have an axiom, that breaks because computation gets stuck at the edge of these axioms. So what you might hope for instead is this homotopy canonicity. If you have a closed term of type net, then you can find a numeral. Maybe you can compute it from the, from the term, and you can also find a, a proof, a path, that the term uh, is equal to this numeral. The proof may then itself use these axioms of univalence, for instance, uh, but at least you, you can still get out the represented numeral. Okay. Um, Bas mentioned this yesterday. We need to prove that homotopy type theory can interpret it in maybe almost any infinity topos. And then a big one is, um, well, we all love infinity category theory, and we think that homotopy type theory should be, uh, should be a foundation of mathematics, so we also need to be able to do infinity category theory in a univalent way. And the big problem is we don't know how to do that yet. So we need to determine whether it can be adequately formalized in hot as hot is at the moment, or if not, prove that it cannot, and then find the principles we need to add so that we can do infinity category theory in a univalent way. Okay, another thing that comes up a lot, uh, so there's a reason that people like extensional type theories because uh, you don't have to care about which proof of associativity of the natural numbers you use when you're using it, uh, and in some sense you don't really have to care about it either with hot except there are some intentional definitions for the programming. It actually kind of tends to come up anyway if you're defining some uh, sequence of types, some higher group boards defined on the natural numbers. Maybe, you, in fact, you do care which proof of associativity of the natural numbers you used as you do some, some constructions. So uh, I think it's an important thing to facilitate reasoning with a strict set such as the natural numbers to get rid of this, uh, this annoyance, which really holds us back. Okay, and then of course we want to formalize more abstract homotopy theory in a sort of synthetic style. So I want to mention recently uh, Guillaume Brunery uh, defended his PhD thesis, which contained a proof that the fourth fundamental group of the three sphere is actually C mod 2Z. Previously, he had a, you know, during the special year, I think he had a very impressive result that um, there, is, there is sigma n in the net such that pi 4 of S3 is C mod nz. So if you had a computational interpretation of homotopy type theory, you could be able to project down that number, run the term, or find the numeral, uh, and then you would get two. <laughs> um, but, uh, okay, so we actually do have a couple of uh, systems that run, but it turned out that when we tried to run this program, um, we had to wait and wait and wait, and it never halted. But presumably, it would halt eventually. Um, but uh, before the, the, the program halted, Guillaume came up with another way of, con <laughs> of proving that n is 2. <laughs> so. Um, can you turn on your microphone and speak up? Uh, the, the, the other way that Guillaume came up with proving this was actually, I mean, 50 to 100 pages of dense mathematics. So, 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 so the, <laughs> uh, yeah, that this emphasizes both that the, uh, uh, the computation is really slow, but it, it would be really good if there would be a faster implementation. Yes, it would be really in, good. In fact, there's now a hack in Agda, which is faster, so that's, we should really has it, been, it. has it been tried to, uh, to, not, to run this Not on this, this number yet, okay, but no. I'll, I'll press them again. Yes, let me know what happens. Uh, we're actually interested in this. Okay, so another thing we usually did, is, uh, so we, we recently did, we constructed the H-space structure on the three-sphere, and this is the quaternionic multiplication, uh, so previously open problem. We construct real and complex projective spaces, but for instance, a still open problem is con to construct the octonionic multiplication on the seven-sphere. So if you want to do something, you could you know, maybe do that. Okay, we still need to give general descriptions of higher inductive types, what, is, what exactly is allowed, what is not allowed. Uh, Mike Schulman and Peter Lumstein has made a lot of progress on this, but I think there's still work to be done. Um, I'm going to come back to these resizing rules later. These are rules that add some very strong impredicativity to type theory, um, but we don't know how to do them in, in, in models yet, and I think... Uh, um, we don't know how to calculate the proof theoretic strength of it either. And that's something that uh, Michael Rachin is working on currently, as far as I know. Okay. Then, of course, we know we want to give this computational interpretation. We already have a lot. I'll mention that. And what I want to emphasize is, uh, given all this work that's going on, what can we say about the proof theoretic strength of type theory as we add univalence and uh, higher inductive types? 
Okay, so the conjecture, um, basically what people conjectured from the very beginning is that it should have nothing to do with proof theoretic strength. It should be uh, conservative over the systems without. Uh, there shouldn't be any recursion theoretic trickery to having a circle in your type theory. And there shouldn't be any recursion theoretic tri trickery to being able to transport uh, between these equivalences in a universe. Okay. So... Let's see what we can, how, how we can make some progress on that. So there was this paper already mentioned a couple of times by Kempulkin and Lumstein. Uh, the first versions had uh, Vovotsky as a co-author. I think the last version just has uh, thanks to uh, Vovotsky. But I think the main ideas are due to Vovotsky, but he was a write-up by uh, Chris Kempulkin and Peter Lumstein. So in the paper, they work in the meta-theory uh, CFC plus two inaccessible cardinals. And... Uh, uh, they or Bavatsky solved the coherence issues by modeling a universe using uh, well-ordered morphisms of simplicial sets. So you basically have to pick well-orders everywhere, and that can strictify things enough that uh, you can um, you can get get out of the coherence problems. So that's not necessary, as Thomas um, uh, told us. You can use the lifting universes approach of um, Martin Hoffman and Thomas Streicher instead. And if you do that, then I checked on paper but not formalized that you can, you can do this in the classical set theory like KPL naught, which was this system that was predicatively reducible locally, or this uh, system KPH, which had the strength of uh, type theory with universes and W types. Okay. And the model readily forms homotopy pushouts. It's actually not very difficult, but if you can look at these slides by Lumstein and Schulman if you want to know how to do it. Okay, so the corollary of this, at least if you believe, uh, it's always a little bit, uh, people are not so impressed to say, I looked at this proof and everything can be done in this system. If you haven't done it in the computer, maybe uh, people don't believe you yet. So uh, maybe take this with a grain of salt for now. But I would say that we do know that uh, univalence and hits do not increase the proof theoretic strength over uh, this system and this system. So basically two systems that people are very interested in. Most of the time you either work in this, actually I don't, I don't think we do any synthetic homotopy theory that yet that uses generalized inductive types, but if we do, it would fit in here, and we would also know that we could re at least proof theoretically reduce it to, um, to this base system. Okay. So much more can be gleaned from the cubicle sets model, basically because they are constructive, so before I talk about the cubicle sets model, when people just say cubicle sets, they think there's one notion of cubicle set. And that's definitely not true. There are many, many notions of cubicle sets. So together with um, Ed Morehouse, I devised this classification, sort of a partial classification of what kind of cubicle sets you can have. So the very basic, the, the, the thing al classical algebraic topologists have been calling cubicle sets correspond to this dot right here in the top left corner. And the classification scheme we are doing here is we are thinking of the base category of cubicle sets as an algebraic theory, possibly um, in a substructural logic. So it's substructural algebra. So you allow, these are the structural rules on the left. The, the combinations that make sense are weakening only, weakening and exchange, and weakening, exchange, and contraction. Okay. And the reason it doesn't make sense to have weakening and contraction is you can derive exchange if you have the right formulation of contraction. Okay, so those are the ones that make sense. And you need weakening to have to call something cubical, otherwise you would call it semi-cubical. Semi-cubical sets might also be interesting. They would correspond to a duplicate of this table uh, one level above without the Ws. Okay, then on the other direction, we have uh, the basic operations. And to call something cubical, you at the very least need to have two face operations. You can substitute zero and one for the left and right face of a cube. So if you can imagine a square and you have an x and a y direction, you can take the left, end, the left side interval, the right side interval, the top interval, and the bottom interval. Okay, so those are the face operations. So the very basic cube category, you just have the degeneracies corresponding to weakening in the algebraic uh, logic, uh, and you have these phase operations. Okay, but you can also add these connections that Andy mentioned, uh, and the reversals, which Andy also had. Um, so the combinations that we think make sense is you can have one connection or both. You can have just the reversals. If you have one of the connections and reversal, you get the other one as well. So it might not, might as well just keep. If you have one, you get the other. Okay. And then, uh, so all of these are modeled by the actual topological interval. 
Uh, and that kind of gives a canonical, uh, a canonical theory in this language. The, the, the position in the table just gives you a language, then you have to tell me which equations are true over this language. And so the canonical thing to do would be to take all the equations that are true of the topological interval, but of course you can consider some subset of those. Okay. Uh, for this corner where you have, a, you know, this is actual just universal algebra because we have the full complement of substructural rules. So here there are uh, some classical work on which kinds of uh, equations you might add. The left point is the uh, equations in, uh, you know, one of the main works of on cubicle sets for type theory, the De Morgan uh, laws. So basically you take the lattice operations, uh, the lattice laws, and then you have the equations that tell you how, how reversal interacts with the connections via the De Morgan laws. Then the middle point, you add one equation, uh, the Kleene law, and that turns out to be a complete axiomatization of the equational theory of the topological interval. So I think it has a special role to play. And of course, you could also, uh, the language of Boolean algebras is also this language. So you could have the theory of Boolean algebras as well. It's a kind of cubical sets that's sort of a little strange. Okay. I added the middle line after Andy's talk. You could consider more complicated notions of cubes, for instance, this uh, IA interval theory. Um, okay, so here's the theorem. Uh, uh, a quick question, sorry. Um, can, you, can you just quickly remind me, I, I know what cleaning algebras are, but it's a different sort of cleaning algebra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could, yeah, could you just overloaded. remind me? <laughs> uh, so the, the lattice law you add is this one. X meet the reverse of x is 1 minus x is less than or equal to y join the 1 minus y. And of course, by uh, replacing uh, this inequality by conjunction with this and equality on with this, uh, you can get a purely equational formulation. This is Kleene's, the Kleene axiom. And, and just out of interest, where is the result about, about um, that being a complete axiomatization? Uh, this is well known in the um, fuzzy logic community. My God. Uh, um, because uh, <laughs> <laughs> they use uh, these algebras as truth value algebras for fuzzy, fuzzy logic. And so there are some papers by Mike Gierke and co authors that establishes this. Okay, so here's the theorem I want to mention. I think it, basically you should attribute it to Grotendieck because it's already in pursuing stacks. Uh, Bas uh, thought about something similar, and I also worked it out for this table uh, presentation with Ed Morehouse. Uh, so any of the notions in, of cubicle sets in the table uh, give rise to a test category. I have to explain what a test category is. Test category is something for which when you take the pre-sheaves, you get um, the homotopy theory of actual homotopy theory, the, the usual presentation of the homotopy category. And uh, there's also something called strict test category where you have the products uh, interact nicely with the topological notion of product. And all except these four give rise to strict test categories. We made counterexamples to show that these four uh, do not give strict test categories. It was well known that this one up here doesn't, but I think it's new that these three also don't. Okay, not very hard to prove based on uh, some results you find in pursuing stacks. Okay, so uh, now on the work of cubicle uh, models. So there's a very influential paper by Thierry, Mark, and Simon Huber, uh, model of type theory in cubicle sets. So this is based on the symmetrical cubicle sets with just zero one. So this is this point. So you have the symmetry corresponding to exchange in the substructural rules, and you have the phase operations. Okay, so that's that point. And then uh, to, to get a constructive model, you uh, want uniform filling conditions. So the Kahn filling conditions are the higher dimensional analogs of uh, the, the axioms for a uh, partial equivalence relation, basically saying that uh, you can if x is equal to y and y is equal to z, then x is equal to c is kind of composition operation, except you need composition operations in all higher dimensions, and they correspond to filling open boxes. So you take a cube, you take out the interior and one of the faces, and then you say if you have that shape in your type, then you can fill it up to a whole cube. Okay. 
Uh, so a very nice thing about the cubicle models is that you interpret an identity, an n cube in an identity type just as an n plus one cube in the original type. That's very beautiful. But however, it only satisfies the, compu the so-called computation rule for the J eliminator, the elimination principles for the identity types up to identity. Okay. Um, so let me speed up a little bit. Uh, the second cubicle model, uh, which actually comes with a type theory, so uh, Seal Cohen, Thierry Cocon, Simon Hooper, and Anas Mertbach, uh, cubicle type theory. So this is based on the Cartesian cubicle sets with connections and reversals and De Morgan law. So this corresponds to this dot right here. Okay. Uh, so again, the computation rules of the J's are only propositional, but Andrew Sw Sw Swan devised a variation based on which you can in, actually literally interpret um, type theory with the usual rules for identity types. It may not be as useful for doing homotopy theory, but it's useful from a proof theoretic and, and foundational perspective because it gives a translation from uh, one theory into the other. Okay, and I think that Seaman Huber is currently working on proving strong normalization. Maybe he's already done. Uh, I just haven't uh, heard the final results on that. Okay, so. This is a fully constructive model, and it can actually readily be formalized in a suitable constructive set theory. For instance, you can take this Z set of minus plus uh, every set is in an inaccessible set, which I, uh, based on a work by Michael Rachin and Laura Crasilla uh, has strength gamma naught, or in Z set F plus uh, this inaccessible axiom, every set is in an inaccessible set. Okay, so in fact, even more can be done. Instead of just playing around with how to formalize this, uh, Mark Bigfoot uh, at Cornell went ahead and did it. Uh, he did it in New Pearl, and not, not only does he formalize the basic models, he also interprets the rules of, of the type theory um, and including a cumulative hierarchy of universes, so it's all really there. And inspecting his proof, so in New Pearl, I'll come back to this in a few minutes, you're always a little worried uh, exactly what kind of type theory are we working in, but you see that it actually uh, doesn't use any generalized inductive types or any fancy induction principles, so it fits inside uh, this, this theory. Or if you wanted to interpret W types in the cubicle type theory, it would fit inside here. Okay, and this model also uh, models push-outs or other finitary high inductive types. Okay, so not only uh, does uh, univalence and these simple high inductive types not raise proof theoretic strength over uh, Martin of type theory with universes plus or minus the W types, but we even have an interpretation into the corresponding non-hot system. So that's very, uh, a lot actually. Okay. Final, I want to make, finally, I want to mention some other work that's very interesting. But first, I want to explain a little bit, little bit about computational type theory, because many people are often confused about this. So the new Perl model of type theory is something that's been developed uh, since the early 80s at Cornell. And what one does is, just like Michael was explaining yesterday, you start with a PCA or some other programming language that's completely untyped, and it's uh, Turing complete. And then you build uh, interpretations of type judgments over this. So in the extensional version, you interpret the types as partial equivalence relations over this universe of operations, or this uh, programming language. Um, so th that defines what it means to be a type, and what it means to be an element of a type, and what it means to be for two elements to be equal, and what it means for two types to be equal. So the basic judgments of type theory, and then one verifies the rules of, say, uh, 79 of type theory with the um, with the reflection rule for identity types. Okay, and you can also add a bunch of other type formers which are valid. So you can interpret in this model, you can interpret intersection types, partial function types, uh, the squash types they had for a long time, quotients and subsets and so on. Okay, so that's a brief introduction to New Pearl. Uh, now, Bob Harper and coworkers have uh, done something similar to the New Pearl model uh, based on a realizability model for higher type theory. So instead of interpreting types as uh, partial equivalence relations, you interpret them as their higher groupoid analogs, namely these Kahn, uh, Kahn types. Uh, so it's uh, the same principles. You need these dimension names, so it corresponds to the Cartesian cubicle sets. Let me just go back to the cubicle sets. This would be this point here. You have the phase operations and Cartesian operation, but you don't have any of the uh, connections or reversals. The way they do generalized Kahn filling, they don't need them. Uh, okay. 
Yeah, so it's much more complicated to define what the, the judgments mean, but once you've done that, you readily get, get the canonicity result. This is sort of false out of the, the work. So if you read these preprints, you'll see how, you know, how that works. Uh, I guess there'll be a paper called Computational Higher Type Theory 3, with, uh, which deals with the universe, but that's not on the archive yet. Okay. Uh, where would we formalize this thing? That's also something that goes to New Pearl. Much of the, the, many of the papers on New Pearl don't really mention a meta theory, so you sometimes scratch your head if you're a little bit of a formalistic bent, say, what is actually going on here? Um, I think a very natural place to formalize the, uh, the old work on pairs and the new work, um, Bob Harbour's on, on con uh, realizability, would be in Feffman's theories of explicit mathematics, basically exactly the setting you need to do this kind of work. You have a basic operational universe, and, and then you have some you know, types or collections that you can get by elementary comprehension, a thing called join and universes. Okay, so now let me wrap up and give you some conclusions. So. Bas already mentioned, we know what happens if we add the action of choice. That was something that uh, basically was done already by Babotsky and was very clear. Uh, we know how the type theory becomes classical and corresponds to uh, CFC plus some number of strongly inaccessible uh, cardinals. So what was much more interesting was what, what happens if we don't go this classical route, we stay constructive, um, we don't add anything except basic univalence and maybe some simple hits. And so we know that known results imply that we do not raise proof theoretic strength above these basic systems, and Bigford's formalization gives an interpretation. Okay, so some, what are some questions from now on? Well, can we give a cubicle type theory or cubicle model in which we don't have to change the path type in order to get an interpretation of the uh, rules for the identity types? Uh, I don't, I mean, people seem, seem a little skeptical, but I also don't, seem to see any argument for why it's impossible. So I think it would be, it would be very clean to, to know if we could do that. Um, now what happens if we take type theory with prop? Even before we start thinking about homotopy type theory, I don't think that's exactly clear. Michael can comment more on that later if you ask him. Um, so in, with hot, we have a same problem, the same problem with these propositional resizing rules. What exactly happens to the strength if we have these propositional resizing rules? And then, of course, we still need to analyze these more complicated higher inductive types, for instance, the Cauchy reals, which are not simple, uh, not reducible. It doesn't seem to be reducible to uh, push-outs. Maybe they are com combined with other generalized inductive types, and, uh, but, you know, so that's something we need to find out. Okay, and then I have one more slide, which is a little bit uh, off the topic of the reservation, or the, of the, off the topic of the talk, but I want to throw out some ideas for the philosophical panel uh, later today. So let me give you the last slide. So, taking a step back, so we have these, uh, we have these homotopy type theories, we have lots of successful set theories, we have successful extensional type theories, can we just take a kind of a pluralist stance and uh, have several foundational systems? We can want to calibrate what, how strong are the subsystems of each? When do we have interpretations? What would it mean to take this such a pluralist stance very seriously? Also, as Bas mentioned, for, even for HOT, a feature is that we have many different interpretations. What do we want to take advantage of that and actually... Um, do these interpretations into other infinity toposes. We can't do that inside of homotopy type theory we, the way we set things up now. So we want to take advantage of having many models. The same goes for set theory. We need to take a step out of the system and do that some other place. So perhaps, this is kind of maybe a little tongue in cheek, but it's also a bit serious. Maybe from this uh, formalization perspective, Affinitist system is actually the best foundation we have because that's something we can all agree on. It's kind of like the greatest common denominator of foundational attitudes. And um, so maybe, maybe that's also a good, a good place to do formalizations. We use the Affinitist system to prove results of the form some other theory T, maybe resting on a more generous foundational paradigm, proves something. And we also get these reductions between them, which allows us to take advantage of many models and interpretations and a lot of proof theory and logic, also in set theory, forcing, and so on. Okay, so that's one idea. The other idea comes in the next two ones. So in type theory, we have this issue that the basic judgments, if you take intentional type theory, they are not primitive recursively 
decidable. They are decidable judgments, but they, they have a very strong uh, computational complexity. Is that a problem from a foundational perspective of type theory that the basic judgments are not primitive recursively checkable? Something I want to throw out for the panel discussion later. And if it is a problem, should we think of a good way to give primitive recursively checkable evidence for the judgments of type theory? One way to do this would just be to add a counter. Once you've checked the proof, you add and say, OK, I needed so many hours of machine time or so many computation steps. But maybe there's a better way of storing a bit of intermediate data so that you could quickly recheck that a judgment holds once you verified it. And that also opens up the way of using proof search in a more um, prominent role in when working with a proof assistant. You do the proof search, maybe very expensive operations, but you save some quickly recheckable evidence once you find your proof. So those are some thoughts I wanted to end with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we have time for a couple of questions. Um, can, can I just ask your opinion about the, um, the first open problem you had on the list? So it, it, it seems to me that the, the, even though Thierry Cochon was originally motivated by that when he started out, and, and he was thinking about Gandhi's proof of yeah. you know, interpreting extensionality in higher order logic, that we, we actually, though all this cubicle stuff and Bob Harper stuff is very interesting. It hasn't got us nearer to, to answering that question. Yeah, I think, I think maybe actually we do have it with the, uh, together with Andrew Swan's interpretation of the identity type. I think that, 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 that does solve it. Yeah, we can strike that out. So, We've done that now. Yeah, I, yeah. Think, so. uh, I think that's right. I mean, yeah, because you can interpret you take the interpretation, run the interpretation once we have normalization. Well, it's a little bit uh, dependent on Seaman Hooper's maybe still unpublished PhD thesis. Uh, uh, but once we have that, if we take that for granted that we have normalization for the cubicle type theory, you oh, interpret it okay, in the cubicle yeah, type right. theory using Andrew Swan's identity type for the identity type. Yeah, yeah, okay. and then you run things and you get this. But then you need to say, well, you still need to produce this proof in the original theory. Yeah, you have to go back. You have to go back. There's a little extra work, but we're almost there. Can I, can I also ask a question? First, a remark. Uh, you said um, that you don't need generalized induction, but I think you need it for the Cauchy reals, right? Yeah, I, I explicitly said ah. the kind of thing uh, I'm talking about. I'm not doing the Cauchy reals oh, and the cumulative Sorry. hierarchy okay, yet. Okay, That's Sorry. an extra. Uh -huh. okay. Okay, okay. okay, okay. And, and another point is, uh, is a very nice list of open problems. Uh, I miss uh, the one about uh, de uh, defining the semi simplicial types. Is it somewhere? Uh, Here. Oh, I see. Oh, it's a subcase of this. Yeah. Okay. Because, and actually, and we know. Uh, okay, the, the one question is yeah. I mean, because you got omega category theory, not omega. I mean, they are different. To me, there are two different questions. The one is okay, whether we can do the semi simplicial types. We know we can do this if we, if we have a two level system. But obviously, the question is do we get away without, which I think is not the case. And the other question to me is even if you have a two level system, how do we formalize uh, uh, infinity one categories? So these are I think that I think we know how to do that. If you have semi simplicial types, you carve out the um, the Siegel space, the the, the semi Siegel spaces, and you carve out of those this, the ones that have uh, units, uh, and then you do infinity ca category theory from there. I think it's you know some work of building things up from the ground, but you can you can get you can get started. Okay. You, you mentioned uh, the resizing rules and prop. So I'm, um, I've been working on this problem. And um, so the resizing rules are basically something that um, kind of repeat what Russell did with his reducibility axiom. Yeah. And, and uh, prop and resizing, we know that at least you get, uh, you can interpret certain intuitionistic set theories with, with negative power set in them. So they, they are much, they are stronger than Sermelo. Uh, but I have a more general question. So um, this, of course, is a challenge uh, for proof theorists and for, for, for foundational reasons. But I, I was wondering, so when Russell introduced his reducibility, it was uh, axiom, it was in some sense, it was a betrayal of his original plans. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I'm, I'm interested, maybe also other people uh, can say something about this. So 
uh, there, there's a way of using impredicativity in this case, reducibility or resizing for just practical convenience purposes. But do you know something essential that um, we wouldn't be able to do without such a gadget? No, only like consistency statements and stuff like that, basically. And uh, I mean, you, you mentioned the Harvey's program, uh, and we're still waiting for something that uh, connects really to core mathematics for that. Maybe, I don't know who's, who's counting. Well, let's do Philip. First, so, I'm not very deep into oh. proof. Okay. Uh, sorry, I thought. No, it's fine, it's fine. Okay, you, you go. First, I am not very deep in the proof theory, but as far as I understood your lecture, uh, they claim that the univalence axiom does not increase proof theoretic strength of homotopy type theory. Assume this conjecture can be shown. Then I ask, why would one insist on the univalence axiom then wouldn't it, this mean that we could drop it? it? It means you can drop it for proving uh, number theoretical statements. But what we're doing in homotopy type theory is we're proving results about infinity groupoids or abstract homotopy types, maybe in some other homotopy theory. And for that, it's very useful. It just tells us that if we then go on to, say, use algebraic topology to prove results in number theory, I guess that's you know, something you might do, you could get rid of the univalence axiom and just get a pure, a, a, a pure proof uh, in the end. Okay. So you mentioned that Baz mentioned that uh, adding AC back to univalence axiom gets you ZFC in a couple of inaccessibles or something. Yep. <clears throat> Is that to do very much with the non-constructive nature of AC? What if you took DC? Dependent choices. Oh, it DC what happens much, then? Yeah, that's much weaker. I don't. I'm not quite. The, yeah, maybe well that. Uh, so with DC, basically nothing happens. Yeah. The proof strength doesn't increase. So you count, countable AC. Yeah, countable. Well, yeah, different version of the RDC. You can also relativize dependent choice. So you can add this to, to systems like CZF, and the proof theoretic strength does not increase. The only thing is, if you if you look for interpretations. Uh, uh, you might want to have the extensional identity type or something like that, but that's all. But as soon as you do AC, it's, it's an old thing. Um, going back to Diaconescu, you get excluded middle. So Peter Axel also had some um, in, in his papers from the, early seven, from the late 70s and, and early 80s. So if you, if, you, if you do anything like adding AC, basically, in the Samelo form that you, uh, you pick an, uh, a representative from an equivalence class. That's the bad case. Then you get basically excluded middle and you destroy the whole thing. <laughs> 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 yeah, I want to add that um, from, a, from the point of view of models, it, uh, uh, DC destroys many of these topos models, these uh, topological models. Yeah. Um, maybe one, one more thing. Uh, some, sometimes you might say, okay, maybe AC is too much. And, but you, you can, if you add something like um, at, at the very low level, so like the limited principle of omniscience or so, which of course was uh, taboo to Bishop, but th such things also don't tend to increase the proof theoretic strength. So you, you could maybe, you could have a world, you say, okay, so there's this world of numbers, which I think I understand, and there I just use classical logic, for num but only for numbers and predicates, uh, decidable predicates over numbers, and, and a little bit more. So I could say, for everything that's arithmetical, with quantifiers over numbers. But when it comes to the universe at large, this, this world of sets, that's something I do not really have a, a good grasp of. And then the idea is, well, maybe they're just, we, we, we just use, uh, we move cautiously and just use intuitionistic logic there. So you can also do such things. So where, yeah, so that's, there's a lot of possibilities. Yeah. Okay, so that, thank you very much.